Good morning, everyone. Welcome to... Now, we do have a special blessing. We're going to have the girls sing a song before we get to our ser sermon. But um, before we do that, let's open in prayer. So if you could, at home, would you join us as we look to our Lord this morning and ask for His help? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the wonderful things that you've done for us. We thank you for the Christmas season we just went through and we just thank you for the reminder that um, you became flesh, you came to this earth to die on a tree, Lord, you, you came to, to die for our sins so that you could rise again, that we could be risen anew and be new creations in you. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful hope for the Christian that we know you have done this work. And Lord, Lord we thank you for this day. We pray, God, that you would bless this service, that you would be honored and glorified in everything that we say and do um, today would be pleasing to you in your sight. Lord, we thank you for this. We ask now that you would bless each one watching and that you would encourage our hearts this morning as we listen to um, the wonderful gift of children singing to you. So we thank you for that, Lord. We just pray that you be honored and glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You and Abby are going to share. Okay. Ready? Jesus loves the little children of the chicken in the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are the chicken in the world. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus died for all the children of Okay, well, hopefully you can hear me this morning. Um, as with everything that you're starting after you haven't done it for a while, there's always some technical glitches to work out. Um, but we do thank you and appreciate your your encouragement this morning to be with us, and um, we thank you for your prayers as well. Uh, I would like to start off this morning by just, um, once again, just welcoming everyone to the service. And I would just like to mention a few things. Now that we're online um, and we're no, we are currently not having any in-house services, um, hopefully for a short time, but for right now we're online only. But I would like to mention that there is the option for those of you that are interested, um, if you would like a transcript copy of the sermon, uh, both this so if you are interested, um, in any of those, uh, please let us know by either emailing us through our Facebook page. Um, now, the other option is if you don't want a, a mail-in copy or a mail copy, then you can also we also email you the transcripts. So I would just like to let you know that that is available um, for those of you that are interested. And um, the other thing I want, they're all listed on our um, Facebook page. So once again, please check that out if you are interested. And let us know. Okay, so with all that said, um, I would like to actually just once again look to our Lord and bow our heads in prayer, uh, particularly uh, for this, this sermon right now. So we can just bow our heads once again in prayer to our Lord. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you, we praise you. We know that you are God and you are holy, you are mighty, you are perfect, Lord. 
There's none like you. None beside you. Lord, you are above all. God, we know that we come to you this morning and we are in an environment, Lord, in our church life that a lot of us may not like. We do not enjoy this. Lord, we'd much rather be together with our family, our church family. But Lord, we must remember that that there are a lot of things in this life that we don't always enjoy. Your word tells us, your, your, in fact, your son, Jesus Christ, told us that in this world we would have trouble as your disciples. But Lord, we know that these trials conform us to the image of your son. And Lord, we also know that there are many around this world who are suffering a great deal more than we are. So, Lord, I pray for them right now, and I think of especially those that are under great persecution. Lord, I think of those that are hiding out in, in caves and in little places to, to gather together with small groups, and as they are risking their lives to meet together to worship you. Lord, I pray that you would encourage them and lift them up and, and lift them up in your your love and your encouragement, Lord, this morning. I pray for those that are watching um, just in this area, this local uh, area of Havelock and, and the surrounding areas. I thank you for their faithfulness and their encouragement, Lord, and I thank you for their involvement in this service today, and I pray, Lord, that you would bless them. I pray, Lord, especially now for this sermon, and I pray that, God, I, I thank you for once again using me Lord, in this way, I, I'm so amazed that you just, you have chosen men like me to do this work. Lord, I, I see myself, and I, I'm so glad that I have been given the gift of faith that you have given me to, to see that you do things, Lord, that are beyond my understanding, beyond my comprehension, because I look at my own inability, my own limited wisdom and understanding, and I, I just... I marvel that you would use somebody like me. But Lord, I know that you do, and I thank you for it. And God, I pray as, as I think of other men who have been called to do this work this morning, that you would encourage their hearts, that you would lift them up, Lord, and, and encourage them to know that they are called by you. And Lord, this is a wonderful, wonderful calling. But Lord, it also presents a lot of challenges. So I pray that you encourage them, strengthen them this morning, Lord, as they serve you in this way. Lord, I pray for those around this world, the missionaries that are serving you constantly in places that are far worse than where we live here. Lord, I pray that you would, that you would bless their work, Lord, that you would show them the fruits of their labor. I pray that they would find encouragement in knowing that their friends and their family, their brothers and sisters in the Lord are praying for them. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them to be bold in their faith, bold in their witness, and as they proclaim the gospel to the lost, Lord, I pray that you would encourage them, strengthen them, give them boldness in that, Lord, and I thank you for that. Lord, I, I look now to this service today, and I ask once again, God, that you would be glorified, that your Son would be exalted, that your church would be, would be purified through your holy word, Lord. And I thank you for the work that you've called us to do, Lord. I thank you for each and every one that has been born again, Lord. Those that have been translated from death to life, Lord. You have done this work. And you, you deserve all the honor, glory, and praise. So I thank you so much for that, Lord. And once again, I just ask for your help, Lord. It is... Lord, I, I, I cannot stand, I cannot even breathe on my own, Lord. You, you must do these things for me, so I just put this in your hands and ask for your will to be done, Lord, this morning. I thank you once again for all you will do in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd just like to mention that um, although we had been looking at previous to our Christmas Eve service, we were going through the book of James, and the last um, chapter that we were on was James chapter 3, and we were going to go through the first five verses of that chapter, but I think we basically made it to 
verse number three. So that's kind of where we had left off before the Christmas season began when we did the Christmas Eve service. But today I'm going to take a break again from James. And Lord willing, we will go back there next week. Um, but for now, we're going to look at what I've actually chosen to be our verse of the year for this local church, this Havelock Fellowship Baptist Church. Now, the one thing that I would just like to mention is that um, today's message, today's uh, verse, um, is, we're actually looking at the passage, but particular verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And although we, we will be spending some time on that one verse this morning, um, I would just like to encourage you to know that, now, we know that this verse is, could be considered a very um, applicable verse for looking into a new year. And it might seem that, well, that's why I picked it, because it talks about being new creations. But I do want to encourage you with something that um, I knew that every year we pick a verse of the year that goes on the front of our bulletin. And I was really struggling this year with, you know, what, what would be a good verse for this year. I mean, not to say that every verse in God's Word is good, but, but I think you know what I mean when I say that. But anyways, I was praying to the Lord. Actually, on Friday morning, I was praying and I was asking the Lord, please just guide me in, in what verse would, would you direct me to choose. So with, um, with praying, uh, after a few minutes, I can say that there is a verse that came to my head, and I, it's just something that, you know, I believe the Lord gave me, and it, it came, and it was 2 Corinthians 5.17. Now, I had only known part of the verse, but I didn't actually know what the passage was, but I knew, I knew the verse itself. So, anyways, I was thinking that verse, and then I, I decided to look up on Bible Gateway um, to get the context, and it was actually the verse of the day on that Friday. So um, I believe that that was confirmation as well, that, that God was you know, showing me that that was, that was his will for that. So I just want to encourage you in all that to know that this, is, this passage, I believe, was given, um, given to me by the Lord. And I thought this passage on its own, again, because it's a new year, we're going into 2021, it can be kind of looked at as a, cl a cliche verse um, because it talks about all things become new. We kind of look at that and say, well, we're going into a new year and it just seems to fit a new year's sermon. But I want to look at it in context this morning because what Paul is saying in this verse is actually a very important truth for us to understand. And it, yes, it talks about being new creations in Christ, but it also talks about the change that takes place in a believer's life. And why I want to focus on that this morning is because what Paul really wants us to know here is that the evidence that we are truly Christian, if we say we confess with our mouth that we believe, the evidence that we really are Christian is that there's evidence that a true change has actually taken place. And that's really Paul's emphasis here is to say, listen, if you have been born again, if you are a new creation, then there will be evidence in your life that suggests that, that, that proves that you really are what you profess to be. So with all that said, I would like to um, look at this morning's verse along with um, a few other verses just so we can get it in context. But we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 19 this morning. And I would ask all of you, if you are able to, stand with me. I know you're at home and I can't see whether you're going to or not. But in respect to God's Word, would you please stand with me this morning as we read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 19. It says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, the first thing I want to mention here is that 
although we're starting in verse 16, we're actually going to be referencing from 12 to 15 quite a bit. In fact, we're going to take a short amount of time this morning to go through those few verses before we get to our main text, which is 16 to 19. Now, again, I want to just take a few minutes and quick, quickly look at verse 12 to 15. Now, you'll notice in verse 16, the first word that Paul uses here is the word therefore. Now, simply, he is saying, when he says the word therefore, he's referencing um, the prior argument or the prior few pit passages um, before 16 uh, that we are to take notice of that because it's important to what he's about to say next. So this is why I'm going back to 12 to 15 because I believe it emphasizes or strengthens Paul's argument from 16 to 17. So let's look at, or 16, 19, sorry. So again, really quickly, we're going to go through verses 12 to 15 here. So notice first in verse 12, Paul's statement, he says, now, he says the word boast. Now, in, you'll notice in verse 12, he says the word boast, but what does he say to boast in? And why should we boast in that? Or why should these, these saints boast in that? He says, well, he's boast on our behalf. In other words, proclaim our example and our faithfulness. Why? That you may have an answer for those that boast in appearance and not in heart. So look again at verse 16. He is saying, do not regard anyone according to their flesh. In other words, don't look at the outward appearance or the outward performance as proof of salvation. And, he's, and he tells us why in the second half of verse 16. He says, because we, you and I, before our conversion were once those that only knew him in this way. In other words, before we were converted, we only served him in our flesh. We only knew him in a fleshly way, a carnal way, or a temporal way. And that's what he means. He says they, have, they had a temporal knowledge of Christ. So really, any motivation to do good, uh, good works, was based on a hope that their religious performance would save them. In verse 12, Paul encourages these saints to use himself and others like him as an example of what it looks like when someone has truly been born again. And he could have confidence, he could have confidence in their example because as he says in the last part of verse 16, yet now we know him thus no longer. So I want you to consider that as we move on this morning, before we move on this morning, how do you know Christ this morning? Do you know him according to your flesh or do you serve him with your heart? Now, as we look at verse 13, what is Paul saying here? He knows that there are some that in rejecting Christ also reject the testimony of his followers. Now, Paul himself was labeled a madman. But look just real quickly back to verse 13 in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. So again, Paul is saying this because he himself, first of all, knows that personally his, his testimony was rejected and he was labeled a madman. In fact, in Acts 26, verse 24, it says, Now as he thus made his defense, this is Paul, he's making his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. So Paul says in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 5, he says, this is for God. Well, that's kind of a strange thing. Someone's calling us mad or crazy because we believe and testify the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is for God? What does he mean here? Well, he says this response from those that hate Christ and his followers, that may not be for the benefit of the one proclaiming Christ or the one witnessing Christ in word or in deed, but it is for God's glory that we are persecuted in this way. So his emphasis, Paul's emphasis here is to encourage the saints to remain faithful regardless of the outcome and only for the glory of God. 
And now he says, it is of sound mind in the rest of verse 13. If it is of sound mind, or if the response seems to be that your testimony is accepted, then be careful not to be puffed up with pride and continue to testify of our faithfulness. Now I know it's sort of extended that or transliterated that, but that's basically what Paul is saying here. If, if it seems like when you're witnessing or testifying of Christ, people are accepting it and they're kind of agreeing with you, he's saying be careful. Because as soon as that happens, there's a tendency for us to think, wow, we must be really smart if people are actually listening to us. But Paul is saying here to these saints, listen, do not emphasize what you are doing. Emphasize the faithfulness of what we have done. In other words, continue to emphasize the, the faithfulness and the good work that your brothers and sisters have done in Christ because that will keep you from being puffed up with pride. But then he says, if this is the outcome, then this is for the good of you. So, again, why is he saying that in, in connection with the outcome that is, it seems to be good, that people are accepting what you're saying? Well, he says this because it should bring us joy and he's saying this to these saints, when we see God using the faithfulness of others to glorify himself. And in 14 and 15, Paul points out the wonderful truth of Christ's work of reconciliation as he describes this truth as a fundamental cause of every good work that a Christian offers as a pleasing sacrifice to their Lord. So this is 14 and 15 now that we're looking at. Now look at what he says in verse 14. What compels us to offer our lives as living sacrifices, even in the midst of persecution? Let's go back to verse 14 and read that really quickly. It says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. So, again, what compels us? Look at what he says, verse 14. We, as Christians, have been called to offer our lives as living sacrifices for our Lord. And Paul knew very well, as much as and a lot of the saints that were with Paul, that were supporting Paul in his ministry, really recognized how much that actually meant, because it cost them a great deal to serve Christ, to testify, and to witness of Christ. And he's saying here that what compels them, what, what, may, what draws them to continue in this way, in, in living as sacrifices to the Lord, regardless of the persecution that we might face. He says, it is the love of Christ that compels us. And when does, why does he focus on this love? Why is Paul emphasizing that this is the love that draws us to do these things, to serve Christ in this way. Well, he is also in this passage, in verses 12 to 16, he's actually referring to, or he's describing the reconciling work of Jesus Christ. And he says that this love is in regards to us being reconciled. Or, uh, it, it talks about the reconciliation work of God, or, or Christ already. Uh, Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So this work of Christ, this love that Paul says compels us, this is the love that demonstrates to us how much he loves us. And this love is what Paul is providing as evidence to the Christian when he says, Because we judge thus. In other words, we have considered these things, this great love, and as he continues, he describes the work that Christ came to accomplish. Now, when Paul says of Christ, he died for all, then all died, he is describing the specific purpose that Christ's death was designed for. He died for all that would believe on him, and for those his death was all sufficient to accomplish everything necessary to reconcile them back to God. It is also for the same people who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
that the phrase, then all die, is referring to. Paul is describing the effect that a true work of regeneration has on the Christian. And for those who are alive in Christ, they first must be crucified with him. Paul describes this process in Galatians 2.20, amongst other places. But we're going to look at Galatians 2.20 today. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So again, Christ died for all of those who would be crucified with him. And in this truth, we begin to see why Paul says that you cannot simply regard someone's outward performance as evidence that they are Christian. In verse 15, we again see Paul point to the cause that a true change in nature will produce. He says, not only did Christ die for all those who would believe on him, but he rose again. And because of this, Paul says that they should no longer live for themselves. So someone who has been translated, who confesses that this is what happened, has happened to them. They should no longer live for themselves. This is what Paul is saying. In other words, the person that believes in this reality should no longer live as though they are still dead in their trespasses and sins. They have been raised with Christ, and as, a, as Paul has described here in this passage that we just looked at in Galatians 2.20, the life we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God. And again, what compels us? What causes us to live for Christ? It says, Christ who loves us and gave himself for us. So this is what Paul is referring to when he says, therefore, in verse 16. Now again, I know that was a long introduction to our main text, but I want us to understand the context again of what Paul is saying here. It is really, really important. We already described the connection between 16 and verse 12. And in looking quickly in verses 12 to 15, we can see that Paul really wants this truth again that Paul describes in verse 17 to be founded on the reality of Christ's work in reconciliation. So he's building this foundation. He's saying that, yes, in 17 you are new creations, but from 12 to 15 he describes not only the evidence, but also the process that has happened because Christ has done this work. And because of what he has done, because we have died with him and are now risen with him, well, now we can look forward to verse 17. Now, the other thing that I want to say here is that Paul desires, and this is the point here, Paul desires for Christ to receive all the credit for this new creation that is described here. So that is who Paul is pointing to in all of this. He's saying, look at what Christ has done for you. Now, notice that the word therefore is used once again in verse 17. So he says, therefore, in the beginning of 16, and then in verse 17, he says it again. Now, he says again, therefore, in verse 17, because he's building off of the argument or the, the, the truth that he just spoke of in verse 16, which again was built on the argument from verses 12 to 15. So really, this is a very strong emphasis that Paul is trying to make here on the reality of the effect of the old man dying to self and being raised again with Christ in newness of life. And that is why Paul says in 17, if anyone is in Christ, in other words, if you are someone who Christ died and rose again for, then Paul says he is a new creation. Notice that Paul does not say they might be a new creation. He doesn't give any, any wiggle room or any area of doubt of what will happen if this has truly taken place in a person's life. He says they will be a new creation. This again implies that a dramatic change in nature has taken place. Notice also that this change, this is interesting, 
This change is referred to here as a new creation. Now Paul uses this wording for one reason at least, to point out that it is God, the creator, who changes the creation. It also illustrates the reality of our corrupt nature before we are changed. In Ephesians, Paul describes us as being dead in our trespasses and sins. This is why we need to be changed into a new creation. Because without this change, then we are dead, as it says, dead in trespasses and sins. Now this is why Christ was sent to die for our sins. So as Paul described earlier, those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ could have their old corrupt nature die with him, so that their newly created nature could be raised with him. So yes, for those of us who are believers, we are a new creation. And Paul has already told us in 15 that if this change has taken place, then we should live for Christ and not for ourselves. But in 17, as we go on, he gives a very practical example or description of what this looks like, this transition of going from the old, putting off the old nature, and being born again and, and being recreated into the new creation and having a new nature. He, he says, this is what it looks like, or this is what happens. So he says, first, old things have passed away. Now what are these old things that Paul is referring to? Well, there's a great deal that he's actually referring to here, and we only have so much time. But Paul intends at least a few things I want to go over. One of them is that he is talking about the old course of living, how we used to live. Now Paul describes this in Ephesians 2, 3. He says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. So he's saying here that this is how we used to live, like all the others, like the ones of the world. We conducted ourselves in the lust or the desires of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So that is a description of how we used to live. So that is part of what Paul is talking about here. As something else Paul seems to have in mind considering the context of this passage, is our old way of practicing religion. Remember what he says in verse 12 about those who boast in appearance and not in heart. This is referring to those who practice false religion. In fact, Jesus spent a lot of time rebuking the Pharisees that were really hypocritical about saying that they were religious and doing something that Everybody thought when they looked at what they were doing in public that they really were religious, but they were actually very deceitful men and very wicked inwardly. So what Paul is saying here is that the old way, the fleshly way that he talked about in verse 12 of just boast of, of showing that you have an appearance of religion, an outward appearance of religion, but that is the old way. That is that is the old way of trying to get to God is by doing your own good deeds. So that is another thing that I believe Paul is referring to here. Before God gives us a new nature, we are blinded to the reality of our helplessness. In this state, in our old nature, we place trust and faith in our own performance and our own good works for salvation. We know what God's Word tells us about our own righteousness. In fact, in Isaiah verse 60, 64, verse 6, we see just how offensive our own good works are to the Lord. In other words, this is the old way which Paul is talking about of trying to please the Lord. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us how offensive that is to God. It says, But we are like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So that is what God sees when you are in the old nature, when you're trying to do things to please Him. It is only filthy rags to the Lord. It offends Him. It does not please Him. 
So Paul is reminding us that both our old nature that was dead in trespasses and sins and the offensiveness of its righteousness has all passed away for those who are believers. It has been crucified with Christ. Something else that I believe Paul has in mind here is what the old man cherished. In other words, we should no longer desire the idols of this world. And that's partly what Paul is talking about back in verse 12, about living, or sorry, verse 16, about living for yourself. But he's saying, in this part of the old man, he is referring, I believe, also to the things that we used to take value in or to, used to cherish. So in other words, if we are in Christ, if we have been truly born again, then we should no longer desires, desire the idols of this world, the things that the world chases after. Now there is a question that I have to ask myself quite often. And it's a hard question to ask, but I want to ask you this question today. Do you truly cherish Christ? Now you may instinctively say, yes, of course I do. I'm a Christian. But consider this. And I want you to really be honest about this. The more you cherish someone, the more you will desire to please that person, and the more you will desire to spend time with that person. So perhaps I should ask the question this way, how much do you cherish Christ? I just want you to think about that as we go on, but really, if you truly cherish Christ, then do you desire to live your life, to conform your life? Because the, the Word of God tells us what is in the old nature, and it, it expresses here, Paul is telling us to put those old things off, but the evidence that you truly cherish Christ is that you truly desire to put those old things off. So please just consider that. Now Paul is telling us here in verse 17 that we are, if we are a new creation, then the desire for the things of this world has passed away. Do you see that in your life? That your desire, do you desire Christ and cherish him above all things? Have these old things, the old desires, passed away in your life? Do you have a different relationship with those things than you used to? And we will end today with this final declaration from Paul in verse 17. He says, Behold, all things have become new. Notice that Paul uses this word, Behold. Now, I, I just want to mention, I know I said I was going to finish to 19, but I'm going to stop here at verse 17. He says, Behold, again at the end of verse 17, all things have become new. And notice that Paul uses this word behold here. This is because he wants us to not just see that our old nature is dead with Christ, and we are now new creations. It's not that he's just saying, you know, your old nature is gone, and now you're new creations. He is saying, with this word behold here, he is saying, look, you need to understand this. Look at what has happened to you, my friends. It is not just that you have been crucified with Christ, but look, you have been raised with Christ. You are now free from the bondage of sin. You will now see everything in your life with a new heart. You are now no longer dead in your trespasses and sins, but you are alive in Christ, and behold, all things have become new. So that is what I want us to consider as we look ahead to 2021 this year. My friends, does 2 Corinthians 5.17 describe who you are this morning? Paul tells us that if we are in Christ, then everything in our life will be affected. A new relationship with Christ should mean that you have a new relationship with sin. Do you? A new life in Christ should mean that you desire to fellowship with the saints. Do you have that desire? The evidence that you have been born again is that you truly desire to put off the old man and all its corruption 
so that you are not led astray by its evil desires. Is that your desire this morning? Now I want to say something, and this is going to be hard for some of you to hear, but I want you to consider your life and ask yourself this this morning. Am I trusting in my own religious performance or is my hope in Christ Jesus alone? And he himself says that he is the only way and the only truth and the only life. Notice that I did not say he is one way and one truth and one life as if there are many other options. It is clear in scripture, is laid out over and over again and Christ himself declares this, that there is only one way to God the Father and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to understand that this morning. And I want you to ask yourself the question, are you trusting in Christ alone for your salvation? Or do you trust in religion or any other thing? Now you might think, as I'm saying these things this morning, asking these questions, that you might have time to figure all that out later. But I would strongly urge you to consider the fact that every breath that you draw at this very moment in your life and all the way through it is provided only by the mercy of God. And that there are many suffering in hell at this very moment that presumed, like you, they had more time. For all the difficulty you may have been through over this year, or even, I will say, the entire year, years of all your life, I can honestly say with all certainty, without a shadow of doubt in my mind, that even the worst moment that you have experienced in your entire life would be considered a thousand times more enjoyable to those who have been cast into the eternal flames of hell. These might be hard things to hear this morning, but I want you to understand that so long as you reject your need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are in ever-present danger of spending all of eternity in never-ending anguish and torment. So please, my friends, if this sounds like something that might be speaking to you this morning, I would urge you, and please know this is out of love, I would urge you, please forsake all of your current hope, whatever you think is going to save you someday, whether it's your own good works, whether it's your own religion, I don't know what it is, but if you are not clinging to Christ and Christ alone, then you will spend all of eternity in hell. And I can tell you for a fact as well that at this very moment in time, so long as you draw breath, that the hand of mercy is extended to you. The Lord himself is beckoning you to come. But one day, my dear friends, and I say this with such, such discouragement in my heart, the Son will reject this call. But one day, that hand that was extended out as mercy will be withdrawn. And on that day, you will no longer know him as Savior, but you will only know him as Judge. And I want to end with this, and the scripture warns us how dreadful that day will be, my dear friends. This is Revelation 20, 11 to 13. Please listen to this. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from those from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Now I just want you to think about that. The face of Almighty God and the face of Jesus Christ on his throne, when those who have rejected him, those who see his face, they will, they will just flee in abject terror from the from the horror, from the, the anger that they will behold on the face of Christ as he is judging the earth. And in verse 12 it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Dear friends, you need to understand that someday that every single one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
This is describing all of mankind here. This is not giving exception to any single person. You need to know that. The sea gave up, in verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. The death in Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Need to let you know this. This is not some hypothetical vision. This is an actual account of what will take place on the day of judgment. So you need to have that ingrained in your mind this morning. And I know we talked about the, the new creation and, and behold all things that become new. But what I really want you to understand for those of you who are not believers this morning, and I do not know your heart, but God does, you need to recognize that this is a reality and every one of you will face this judgment someday. So please take this word into account. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful truth that we have looked at today. We know that if we are in you as new believers, as new creations, we can be sure that not only have you done the work of reconciliation on the cross of Calvary. You have brought us from death to life. You have, you have translated us from the darkness into the light. Lord God, for those who believe on your work and your person and all that you have done on our behalf, we can be sure, Lord, that someday when those books are opened, that you will, you will declare for those that have been born again, that have been trusting in your Son and you, that they will be called into heaven to spend all of eternity with their Heavenly Father. But Lord, for those who reject this truth, for those that have heard this message today and deny the truth of it, for those that are still in the old man, the old nature, Lord, may it be May it be so that they do not have any rest, that they do not have any peace of any joy at all until they come to a place of recognizing their sinfulness and their wickedness before you. And they repent of that sin, Lord. And they ask for your forgiveness. Lord, may it be so in the lives this morning that are listening. Lord God, I thank you for these things. I thank you for what you will do in them. I thank you for who you are and what you've done for your people. We thank you for all these things in our more, most precious and wonderful name. We ask it in that name is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.